न्यूज फर्स्ट न्यूज लाइन विद फराज शाहकुटाली and a very good evening to you and a warm welcome to Newsline Live using Zoom. And um, the fact that uh, Sri Lanka is facing um, five crises at the moment, and uh, needless to say, they are the economic crisis, the dollar crisis, the food crisis, the tax crisis, and now the interest rate crisis. We thought we'll get a uh, person who knows a thing or two who understands economics. Uh, who better than that, eh? Uh, but uh, before that, I, was, I thought we'd pose the question uh, on behalf of all of us, actually. Is Sri Lanka aiming to tax its way towards growth? Let's find out, shall we? Our guest this evening, joining us by Zoom, is uh, from the Department of Economics at the University of Colombo, Mr. Umesh Muramudali. Very good evening to you, Mr. Umesh. Good evening, Bras. Uh, happy to be on the show. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Umesh, if I ask you, is Sri Lanka aiming to tax its way to growth? Is that what's well, happening? Um, uh, let, me, let me put it this way. Sri Lanka uh, need to tax in order to sustain the growth, in order to uh, move towards the trajectory that Sri Lanka can achieve economic growth. The reason why I'm saying this is uh, one of the fundamental problems with Sri Lankan economy is the taxation. And currently, as you all know, we are going through a debt restructuring process. And for this debt restructuring process to work, uh, sadly, taxing people is uh, important. And it is an essential. I mean, there are things, thing or two that actually the government needs to do to ensure the tax collection rather than just imposing taxes there are things that needs to be done but fundamentally uh, everybody need to pay more tax in order to achieve a sustained growth let alone growth actually i would even go to the extent of saying survival because if you go back a uh, few months ago mm. we've been in a situation where we've been in fuel queues 12 to 13 hour electricity cuts no gas you know a very difficult situation to continue the continue on you know, day-to-day activities. So for us to ensure that we are not going back to that, mm. we need to pay taxes uh, uh, to, to <clears throat> ensure the current progress. But uh, I put it to you, uh, Mr. Uh, Moramudali, that uh, we don't really need to do any of that because our economy used to be around 80 billion, just a bit over that. And today it is contracted downwards to about between 60 and 65 billion. So consumption is down anyway, thanks to the fact that the economy has contracted in size. So mm -hmm. uh, if you look at uh, fuel usage and all that, everything's down. So therefore, um, when you look at having to uh, sort of increase the tax net, um, we notice uh, a couple of things, really, that um, with the, especially with the, uh, the interest crisis, we will never see, I, I as a layman, I can't see how we're going to reduce the cost of food. Uh, I'll tell you why my concern is, because before, the price of fertilizer was 7,000 rupees a ton, 7,000 rupees a ton. Today, it's more like 200,000 rupees a ton when we're talking about fertilizer for paddy. And for all other uh, uh, produce, it's 360,000 a ton. So when you have interest rates so high, how on earth are we going to reduce the cost of food? Already we have people who are really put out and they're struggling. They can't have not three, not even two. Some of them I think are having just one meal. There are children who are fainting at school. So could you explain as to me as a layman how we are going to reduce the cost of food? Uh, right. I think uh, when we talk about the cost of food, first we have to understand why the cost of food is high. One of the major reasons is because the exchange rate fluctuations, right? 
so the exchange rate uh, as long as it's not going to come down some some food prices will remain high so what we need to understand is at this point of time what we can do what the government can do is to make sure that they actually give food to the poor and vulnerable uh, sadly at this point it's very difficult to curtail the food prices because you see the global food prices are high global energy prices are high on top of that we saw our exchange rate skyrocketing from around you know within one year so we was, saw exchange rate was around 200 and now it's almost 360 37 sorry can right? i so, can i ask you so was that a good idea to float the rupee we had 203 uh, going to 372 uh no the the thing is the way they float the rupee they hold the rupee for a very long time artificially so that created a black market and that is what caused exchange rate to depreciate this further so it is the fault of the previous central bank uh, administration which forcefully kept exchange rate at 203 and then suddenly decided to increase to 230 But so that policy saw, that policy i put it to you again i put it to you that that policy is not made only at the central bank uh, and or the monetary board that because the uh, the central bank is not really an independent institute by any stretch of anybody's imagination politics comes into play no you are absolutely right you are absolutely right this is why the central banks are supposed to be independent and have a lot more independence in determining the exchange rate policy so instead what we did was we forcefully kept exchange rate because the government also was pushing for that right so that was clearly a wrong policy decision for which we are still paying well right so but what about this the people i'm not talking about the people in the urban areas and in colombo and mm-hmm. so on i'm not talking about them i'm talking about the wider picture how on earth can we have uh, the the price of food come down when the interest rate is so high when the the rupee is fetching three, 370 or upwards of that uh, to the dollar well uh, when we talk about the interest rate if the interest rates are high yes the finance cost is increasing but the alternative to that i think <coughs> central bank governor also repeatedly mentioned this alternative to that is having even higher inflation because if you don't have high interest rates at this particular moment of time that will mean lot more money printing that will create further inflation and if the further inflation happens then the poor and vulnerable will be much more exposed to them must be exposed to the crisis rather than what they are exposed right now but so uh, at, sorry at I, this I point, let me let me for yeah. us uh, uh, at this point sadly controlling food prices is quite a difficult task economists from who taking a very alternative point of view might disagree with me but the point is at this point some food prices may remain high because exchange rate is out of our control and if we let the interest rates go any further down that might cause the prices further so that is where the government comes into the picture by providing sufficient cash transfers and food to the poor and vulnerable i mean that is for me that is why a government exists to take care of the poor and vulnerable so that's why at this moment a proper social safety net or what we call a proper direct cash transfer system is important it's important but is it in place uh right now no right now what we see so what here, i mean here, so the people the suffering the social distress the people continues um you you said that it was bad policy to to peg the dollar art- the rupee artificially to the dollar but i put it to you that even today that's what's happening excepting it's not pegged at around 203 it's now pegged at around 365 370 the same thing but a different level well uh, i mean it doesn't matter which administration does it uh, no no I, I, the- i'm not saying which administration i'm saying about i'm talking about the pegging of this uh, of the rupee dollar rate from 200 peg there now to 360 so if you're going to peg might as well peg it down below so that the poor man gets the benefit i'm talking uh, from a people centric point uh no i'm i'm not disagreeing with you what i'm all saying is that pegging the rupee further down will prevent people getting money into the banking system even more 
already what what this pegging did last time was to create a black market huge black market for dollars and any other foreign currency and because of that people are not really bringing in foreign currency to the banking system so this this becomes a whole problem right so but this is why they're, they're not doing if, that now too i have uh, some uh, sri lankan um, expatriate workers in the seashells uh, working in the uh, leisure industry there they told me that when they send their dollars into sri lanka to the non banking system they get 50 rupees more per dollar 50 rupees more per dollar yeah i mean i presume I, it's more than the official rate it is no no this is this is the problem uh, because any in any economy you will see a black market exist but the those that black market will pay maybe you know four five three to four five rupees extra but uh, as you're saying if they are, if that black market is paying 50 rupees extra then people will definitely shift to that but and, the mechanisms and, and they told me and they told me that they get the money delivered to their home you know it's like door to door which is a takes a whole new meaning on, on the word of uh, uh, excellence in service delivery fair fair i think this is uh, now the the issue is people usually are reluctant to use this kind of methods because of the trust lack of trust right because it's not like you are working with a bank bank that's that's trust you are working with an institution but uh, but what happened when the rupee was pegged for a very long time people were compelled to use these unofficial channels now they have gotten used to it right now that the trust was built there was enough time to build the trust because government was kept the rupee at an artificial rate for a very long time so people got used to these systems now as you say those money could be delivered so there's a very personal relationship built among these yundi lo hawala dealers and those 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 who send money through them now it's very difficult to bring it back to the bank system but i, I but i hope that gradually that uh, shift will happen and uh, thank you for all your questions uh, as usual by whatsapp or sms to 0772300305 uh, I think a card's coming up on your screen now. And thank you, too, to our viewers from uh, Liz Truss's capital city, uh, London. Uh, and especially for one of these questions from, from London, uh, here to you, uh, Mr. Umesh. And it is this. Uh, how are we going to pay our dollar loans if we don't have dollars? Okay, right now we are not paying any dollar loans. We have halted this. We are right now in the debt restructuring process, right? So what we are right now doing is gradually building up uh, foreign currency reserves. And how are we doing that? We are doing that through the exports. This is why, as I mentioned, dollars coming into the banking system is important. Now, once we finalize the debt restructuring negotiations, uh, we will start repaying foreign loans in another maybe two or three years up until that two or three have years life. my god yes i think no because this is how the debt restructuring works because we are right now in a sovereign default because that means we don't have actually money to repay the foreign loans we, i mean we are barely managing our imports right mm. so we need some period to adjust to build foreign currency reserves so that we are able to repay the foreign loans consistently so it is that restructuring process uh, that has been taking place. And for that purpose only, we need more dollars into the banking system. We need more taxes to show the intent that we are carrying out necessary reforms to that so that we can be paying, your, paying the loans of the external creditors in a, another two or three years. Just before we go, just ahead of a break, um, can I ask you, um, do you agree that if we go, uh, go on at this rate, uh, in this kind of model, this kind of action plan, that Sri Lanka will have a dollar crisis for at least another 10 years? I mean, if, if some of the reforms do not happen, and most importantly, if, if there's no political backing for the reforms, if people don't back uh, these reforms politically, it is inevitable that this dollar crisis will uh, last for a very long time. For me, I think it is important to have an election soon uh, because the the 
people need to be agreeing with some of the economic reforms and people need to see progress and unless those issues are sorted this crisis is sadly going to be long lasting and um, on that note let's go for a quick break take a peek in this evening's headlines from that wonderful news first prime time news team we'll see you on the other side of the break News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukatali. Shehan Karnatilaka bags 2022 Booker Prize in big win for Sri Lankan literature. The winner of the 2022 Booker Prize is the Seven Moons of Mani Almeida. Me pota mang ogalan taliuwe make a dilumak rata paraje vela inna kaale ka make a Clinical bowling display helps Sri Lanka crush UAE. It is taken. This time around, Patim Nisanka makes. Petroleum products special provisions bill passed. Police obstruct IUSF protest march against suppression. <laughs> Trusted place for your fixed deposit. Valuable FD, 25% for two months. 25.5% for four months. Valuable FD, the symbol of stability. News First, Newsline with Faraz Shaukatali. And welcome back to Newsline Live tonight by Zoom along with Mr. Umesh. Uh, Mora Mudali, who is, of course, from the Department of Economics at the University of Colombo. Thank you again to you, Mr. Umesh. Uh, now then, basically, what you're saying is that we don't really have much of a choice and the kids will have to continue fainting. Uh, the humanitarian aid that's coming from local people into local schools will probably help the children have some lunch um, but the problems the real problems we are postponing the inevitable like malnutrition when pregnant mothers and newborn babies don't get the right uh, nutrition they, this results in stunted growth stunted IQ but these things are not apparent today they're down the line two three four years so we are postponing the inevitable. Then you, you sort of mix it up, if you like, with the brain drain. It's not a crisis yet, because we've only got five, but it might be six. So can you see where I'm coming from, Mr. Umesh? Yes, Don't you yes, think uh, that we must, we must, we must reduce the prices of goods? Well, I mean, the, what, what's the way of, for me, one way of reducing prices is imposing price controls. And the moment we impose price controls, what happens is there'll be hoarding and there won't be foods av food available. We, we saw this happening and we saw this happening in 1970s as well. Right? So I don't see price controls as a way of getting out of this crisis. What I'm saying is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it is the government's job to protect the poor and vulnerable. Uh, what about I don't what about subsidies? What about subsidizing the fertilizer? That way, you could reduce the price of uh, no, definitely. The rice. For us, I think you see that it is important to understand. Okay, there are two aspects to the story. One is that we need to increase the local production, right? And for that, whatever the subsidies, whatever the uh, support that the farmers need, that needs to be given, right? What we one thing what we did was we uh, the previous government went ahead then ban the importation of fertilizer so that resulted in a significant reduction of crops so but but that won't be resolved as soon as we wanted to because this will take some time in the meantime it is important that the government directly gives food and also uh, money to those who are poor and vulnerable because the government can actually shift the expenditure patterns they don't need to be focusing on building new bridges new buildings, constructing new highways, so on and so forth. All these unnecessary extravagant expenditure can stop, including the, the massive amount of money that might go into the 
uh, welfare of MP, so on and so forth. So, and that money can be channeled to provide food uh, and as well as money to the poor and vulnerable because they are the ones who are affected. Now, when I see, when I look at the crisis, I see three segments of the society. One is you have really poor and vulnerable the the ones that you mentioned the kids are fainting in the school kids kids don't have anything to eat they they sometimes skip three or four meals uh, at a stretch that kind of people and then you have the middle class and then you have the upper class now what i personally believe is that upper class and middle class still has the ability to survive it might be difficult for them to maintain their normal lifestyle but still they will have enough food to eat so the government need to focus extra on the poor and vulnerable and then provide them uh, with necessary support and that that won't happen unless you shift your expenditure patterns and also if you don't uh, tax enough uh, tax the rich enough um, now when we talk about the taxation i personally don't think that merely putting a tax policy will increase the tax revenue tax policy means nothing without fixing the tax administration we have long way to go in terms of tax administration our Revenue Administration Management Information System, which we often refer as premise, has a lot of loopholes. Those things need to be fixed as soon as it can, because otherwise we can bring and we can change tax rates, and that means people will still dodge, people how, will still uh, avoid taxes. Mr. Right? Mr. Ramesh, how are we going to fix this problem when our legislators, the politicians that we elected, when they're so busy fighting and juggling and still enjoying the benefits. I would like them to tell me, to tell us, all of us, the people of this wonderful country, what are the cuts that they have? Which part of the belt have they tightened? They, everyone's yeah. talking, but they're not, they're not coming here or giving an interview to the island or to the, one of the papers or anywhere or using their social media tools to tell us what they are doing. What are they doing? Is it, why is it always got to be the people, people, people paying? Peg the dollar, now they're pegging it at a different rate. And no chicken, the price of chicken, eggs, it's too expensive. No, you're absolutely right, Faraz. I think for this, what we, what I don't think the politicians understand the gravity of the problem that we are facing. They think this is as another election tagline. This, the, let me remind again to anyone who's watching or any politician who may or may not listen to, this is a very, we are, we are facing the worst crisis in our history. And there's no easy way out of it. And while but, we are saying that people need to sacrifice, I think the first sacrifices first need to come from the top, from the president, prime minister, and all the ministers and the MPs. They need to show, they need to show that they are willing to sacrifice, they need to show that uh, they are willing to let go of some of the benefits, so on and so forth. Then only people will have faith. In fact, I would go to the extent of saying that this is why we need an election. I don't think the parliament right now has the legitimacy anymore, in my opinion. This, this has to change. People need to be able to give their vote and change the once they have elected in 2019, because it's not 2019 anymore. President Vikramasinghe, nearly 90 days in, but he said, Churchill-like, he came, his own admission, his own words, that he came here because of the crisis, indicating in Talia that he would resolve the crisis. It's no good saying that the fuel queues are less and there's no gas queues. That's because consumption is down. The economy mm. has contracted from... 80 billion to 60, 65 billion. That's why we're not producing enough. And anyway, how are we going to increase exports? What have we got? We don't have raw materials. We have to import them. How are we going to pay? Not with shirt buttons, with dollars. Where is the dollars? Right, yeah. I, I mean, this is where, again, we have to refer back to the point where there has to be faith amongst people. Uh, some people are also not sending dollars through official channels because they also don't have a uh, faith in the political system. This is why I keep saying that the economic reforms are the key to success or key to get out of the, uh, this economic crisis. For that to happen, people need to support economic reforms. 
Now we see the tax changes coming this year, but we might see people not having any faith in these tax changes and they will go back on the street, protest, so on and so forth. So then what will happen is we will go, go back to square one where we were a few months ago. So that is why this it is not about an individual. President president might be saying that he can get out of the crisis. I don't think it, that's an individual's job. That's a job of all of us together. And for that, we need to focus on it as a country. And for that, I think there has to be an election so that people can express what they want to, rather than uh, just relying on what uh, the, the, the reforms that the government is doing. Because when the economic reforms are carried out by the people who are not politically legitimate, people who don't have the legitimacy, then the reforms itself become problematic. The reforms may be good, but people will not see it as a good thing. And that's, that's I think, as a serious issue. Don't you, be that as it may, don't you think that all of us, you, me, them in Parliament and wherever they are, the only solution is a fertilizer subsidy aimed at the food production in Sri Lanka. Um, certainly fertilizer subsidy could help and also the fertilizer uh, supply. One of the biggest concerns in last few months has been there hasn't been enough supply of fertilizer. There has to be uninterrupted supply of fertilizer and to ensure that there's no black market. Right? Well, Certainly a subsidy is important because the farmers cannot uh, bear the brunt of it. It's important because most of the, most of the people involved in the agriculture are poor. And uh, that's important. While that's also important, we also must insist on interrupted supply because if you, if you give subsidy and don't give enough supply, then they, that will also create a black market. So while subsidy is not the only thing that we should focus on, I think we should also focus on uninterrupted supply as well. Uh, I, I have to say this to you. Uh, I just like, to, I'm sure you're aware of it, but in the United States, you know, the, the king, the top gun of the capitalist world, over 20% of their working population is in the farming, the agriculture sector. And they those people are not poor. They have yeah. a standard of living that puts the whole of Sri Lanka, all its politicians, legislators, everybody, to crying shame. Because look at the plight of our farmers. They were the first lot to, of people to protest. It wasn't the silent protesters in Kowala, however good it was. It was the farmers. And if you go through our footage, you'll see that it was the farmers who protested first because they spotted the folly of what the Ra President Gotabe Rajapaksa was attempting to do. Ill-advised, mismanaged, completely, utterly useless. And today, people are saying, oh, we need, the people need to tighten their bills, pay more taxes. But what are they doing in Parliament? Do we need elections, Mr. Umesh? Do we need elections? I think we do need elections. This is my personal opinion. But I think we do need elections because uh, we need to have legitimacy for the economic reforms, as I've repeated, dimension. And unless economic reforms don't happen, we, we might be looking at a uh, foreign debt default again. And that has happened to many countries before. Belize, Argentina are good examples. And we might go down the same road if we don't do the right thing. I think one of the right things to do is actually uh, have an election. Do you think it will happen? The right to dissolve parliament, ladies and gentlemen, accrues to the president of Sri Lanka at the end of February. Mr. Umesh Moramudali, from the Department of uh, Economics at the University of Colombo, what are your students saying? Do they want elections? Do you think that the president will exercise the powers that accrue to him at the end of February and dissolve parliament? Um, I think what my students, from what I've, what I've heard, is that they also prefer to have their say, so which means they would want to have an election. But in terms of what president wants to do, I'm, I'm genuinely not sure what he would do. 
uh, I've followed his political career, which has been, you know, roller coaster side. Uh, you never know what he'll do. So I, I really can't say anything about that for us. I really don't know. Well, maybe it's heads I win, tails you lose. But Umesh, thank you very much for being on Newsline. Thank you for us. Pleasure to be on the show. Thank you. It's now time for that other wonderful program, which is, of course, the primetime news from that hardworking team up there. And uh, in the meantime, I'll take leave and say to you, as always, God bless you all.